There are infinite ways to look at the world. However, most people fall somewhere within a very specific spectrum. On one side of the ring, we have the scientific or logical side of it. On the other side, we have the spiritual or esoteric. Some people belong fully to one team or the other. Seeing and experiencing the world completely skewed either to the logical side, like an atheist or a full-on scientist or an extreme skeptic, or to the spiritual, like someone extremely religious, a psychic, or a believer in everything that cannot be proved. However, most people fall somewhere in the middle with some mild preferences. I used to be 90% science and 10% spirituality. Now I would say that I'm more like 55-45, which means I am mostly in the middle with some mild preference toward logic and science. Reuniting science and spirituality has become one of the pillars of my philosophy, and I believe that it is essential to do so if we want to live a more wholesome and joyful life, and if we want to live in a society that is more healed and has a more wholesome way of looking at the world. Today, let's explore what these worldviews are, how they are formed, how trauma plays a role in them, why it can be hard to change these worldviews once they are established, but also why it is important to try to land as much as in the middle as possible. So let's start our exploration. What's up? I'm Ivan with a decade of experience facilitating healing ceremonies. And during that time, I was exposed to so many crazy experiences, both personal and from others, that were really hard to grasp or label under the lens of science, which is, by the way, the one in which my brain is wired and that has a very strong tendency toward. Every time that something impossible to describe through the lens of science would show up, I would try to somehow explain it using some form of logic. And I am really grateful to this process, as it has given me the chance to explore perspectives where both worldviews can be true at the same time, where they actually coexist and do not conflict. Today I operate under the belief that both science and spirituality are just that, lenses through which we see and experience the world and that they are both valid. Another way of saying that is that what we have is a raw experience and some people are wired to look at it through the lens of science and some others through the lens of spirituality. Here's one more way of saying that. If you are born with grain tainted glasses, you will look at the world much greener than other people, yet you might never find out. As long as you don't know that you have a pair of glasses on, there is no way that you will ever find out that the way in which you see the world is a tainted perspective filtered through those glasses. You will think that's the way the world is and that it simply cannot be any other way. The person in front of you that was born with red glasses will think that you are wrong by seeing the world a little bit greener and that the world for real has a red tone to it. Though I gotta say that from that point of view, the world is actually greener on the other side. <laughs> oh my god, that was so bad. Okay, let's focus. We are all born with those glasses, but instead of green or red, it's science or spirit. This is the exploration that we will be doing today throughout this video. It is to realize that you, me, and everyone else are wearing those glasses and that we are so used to it that we don't even notice it. And second, to see if we can, even for a moment, take our glasses out and see how the world looks like without them, and if we can, maybe put the other set of glasses on and experience the world through a different set that we are not used to. Okay, so let's use wounding as our example. Wounding is a raw experience before we see it from any lens. When looked at it from the lens of science, we can say that wounding is an experience that falls under the category of traumatic, generating stress response, and thus being saved in the amygdala as a very specific connection between neurons generating a unique neural pathway saved in the part of the brain that is dedicated to fear and stress response. Every time anyone is reminded of that experience through any form of trigger, that neural pathway gets activated, generating a fearful or stressful response. Now, is that true? Yes, of course it is. That is exactly what wounding is, from the lens of science. Now, some people are not going to feel that that is the lens of science, but the lens of truth or the only right answer. That is a great sign that you cannot see that you have a very specific set of glasses on. Why is that? Well, because we can also use the spiritual lens in which wounding is an experience that creates pain in your emotional body, in which your feelings have been hurt, and that makes your vibrational field to lower. Now, is that true? Yes, it is, from the lens of spirituality. 
And some people are going to think that that is not the lens of spirituality, but the lens of truth, that that is the only right answer. And there you go, that's another reason to believe that you are seeing the world through a lens without noticing that it is a lens. If you're on the scientific side, you might think that last bit was complete BS. I understand how that might feel, as I would have felt the same at some point. So let me try to explain it to you using your language, logic. Do people experience emotional pain? Yes. Is that pain saved anywhere where we can see it or touch it? No, but it is there. Well, where is that pain then? Wherever that place is, that is what we call our emotional body. We have a physical body, which is everything that it is us that we can touch and see. But we also have an emotional body. Basically everything that it is me that I cannot touch. Now, why do I call it a body? Because a body is a vessel. So my emotional body is the part of me that holds my emotions. I recognize my physical body not as me, but as a part of me, because there are other parts too like my mind or consciousness, which is not the same as my brain. I also recognize my emotions as a part of me and not as the totality of me. And I can also recognize that my emotions are being held by something. They are somewhere in the same way in which my skin, my blood, my organs and everything else is being held by my physical body. That thing that I cannot see that is holding my emotions, that vessel is what I call my emotional body. Now, what I would have said to this in my old days of hardcore atheism is, your emotions are nothing else than a very specific electrical impulse saved in your brain as a neural pathway. That's where they are stored. Oh yeah? Well, let me tell you something, old me. You are completely right. <gasps> uh, oh, I did not expect that. Yeah, you seem so ready to argue. Relax, man, this is not a competition. But I won. However, those neural pathways, exactly the way they are, wouldn't necessarily mean that that creates a space for your emotions to live in. They could just be, literally, blank electrical impulses without any meaning or experience. The fact that their existence allows for the container in which your emotions thrive, that container that is a consequence of seemingly random neural pathways, that is what I call the emotional body. It could be just neural pathways, but those neural pathways create that container. From the perspective of science, the neural pathways are the cause and the container of the emotions, the consequence. Basically, the emotional body would not exist without the physical cause, which are those neural pathways. But from the perspective of spirituality, the container is the thing and it expresses itself through those electrical impulses. The container is the cause and the physicality of it is the consequence. From this perspective, those neural pathways wouldn't exist or even form if we wouldn't have already the innate capacity to feel emotions, or better said, if we wouldn't have an emotional body. So, which one is right? Well, if you're thinking something like, duh, it's so obvious that the right answer is blank, this means that you still cannot see that you have a pair of glasses on. Another way of saying that is that your perspective can change if you take those glasses off. You might not want to change it, which is absolutely okay, and I am not asking you to do so. Getting attached to a perspective so strongly without being open or willing at all to let go of it usually stems from early traumatic events. And I am not talking about being beaten up or something really extreme. We will talk about this in a minute. I, of course, can't claim to know the answer. However, what I can do is give you the perspective that I've been finding in my experience exploring this topic when I would dive within and also when I would witness so many people doing healing work. And I want to remind you that I already had a biased opinion towards science. And that perspective is one that is really hard for our world of duality to grasp. And that is that both of them are true at the same time. No neural pathways would exist if the emotional body wouldn't already be there. And no emotional body would exist without the possibility of those neural pathways. None of them are causing each other first. Instead, they are both causing each other at the same time. This concept is really hard to grasp, but we have hints of it if we look other places. For example, the concept of time. Most people agree that it seems that there isn't a beginning of time or an end to it. We try by saying things like, time started with the Big Bang. But the immediate counterargument is, well, what made that mass be there to start with? What happened before? And that conversation can go forever. The same happens between religious and non-religious people. What created the world? 
God. But what created God? Well, he was always there. How is that even possible? Uh, I don't know, I guess it is. <laughs> All these conversations are so hard to have because we live in a world of duality and our brains are wired to experience the world in that way, talking about concepts that don't fall under the category of duality. If you are new to the concept of duality, here's a really quick summary. Our brains can grasp the idea of cold and hot, day and night, masculine and feminine, pain and pleasure, science and spirituality, or even beginning and end. Everything is an experience that lands in between two sides of the spectrum. The second that we try to break from that, our minds have such a hard time understanding that experientially. For example, there's no beginning or end. It always was and it always will. But how? God was always there. How? Time never started. There is infinity going backward and infinity going forward. Uh? These are so hard to grasp because these are concepts that live within the realm of singularity. It is like a two-dimensional being trying to understand our world or for us to try to understand how a world would look like with four dimensions beyond height, width, and length. Which, by the way, that fourth dimension or any dimension after that can be mathematically proved of its existence uh, through integrals and derivatives, a concept that I used to teach for many years. Yet it's almost impossible to imagine how that would look like with our brains wired for three dimensions. This is why concepts like emotions and your pathways create each other and are there because of each other at the same time are really hard to grasp because those concepts live within the realm of singularity. Now let's go back to the example of wounding. I also mentioned that from the spiritual side, wounding is an experience that lowers your vibrational field. Now what on earth does this mean? I promise it doesn't need to be complicated. We can make it complicated and sometimes we do by talking about the wavelengths that our body emit that cannot be measured, or our aura becoming more purple because it's connected to our seventh chakra. But let's not. We can simply say that the more the wounding, the more negative thoughts and the more negative self-talk. That way of being and going around the world is simply the vibe that we put out. When people get in touch with me, they can feel it through my body posture, my lack of eye contact, my lack of openness, and the constant complaining that comes out of me. And then they leave this meeting feeling worse because they have been emotionally affected by my current state. If you agree with this, why couldn't we just simply call this our vibrational field? As the field or area around us that emits certain vibrations through our physical atoms and also the wavelength of light, yeah, this light here, this one, that bounces on us and is received by other people's eyes, that creates a very specific state of being in them that is similar to the state of being that we were already having. As you can see here, a vibrational field exists, and for scientists, it will be the consequence of how my atoms are vibrating. And for the spiritual, the atoms move in that way as a consequence of the field. And I say, it is both at the same time. Whether you feel that the scientific or the spiritual perspective is more accurate, I hope that by now you can start seeing that these are simply ways in which we see and experience the world and that each one of us has a tendency or a preference for one or the other. So what creates that preference? Well, a combination of our society, our parents' teachings, our upbringing, our natural interests and our wounding. Going back to the example of wounding, for the spiritual person, the real experience is the pain that our hearts go through. And whatever happens in our brains and our neural pathways and all of that is simply the way in which the real experience is stored or expressed in our brains. For the scientist, the real experience is whatever is happening physically in our brains and our emotions or our pain is the consequence or the manifestation of it. We can overall say that science intends to understand how things work through the physical realm, and spirituality through everything that is not physical or also called as the esoteric realm. Yes, I am aware that there are social sciences like psychology that are not based on the physical, and that the definition of science is about observation, experimentation, and testing theories against evidence using the scientific method. However, this is not about definitions, but about how people tend to experience the world. Here is another example. Scientifically, we know exactly why it rains water evaporates from the surface of the earth, that water vapor is lighter than the air and so it rises, forming clouds. The water droplets start unifying 
and eventually they become heavier than the air and so it falls. However, if you were to ask polytheistic societies from thousands of years ago, they would say that it rains because of the god of rain, one of their many gods. To anyone today, including many spiritual people, that sounds completely ridiculous. Once we know how rain works physically, it is almost impossible to bring a non-physical explanation of it because we can absolutely prove and confirm that rain works through evaporation and condensation of water. But is that true? Is it really true that because one explanation is true, then the other one is invalid? From the neutral perspective, the one that does not try to explain it, it simply rains. From the viewpoint of science, which is already a way of explaining the world, water evaporates and condenses and therefore it rains. From the spiritual perspective, there is a natural intelligence that allows for rain to even be possible. That is the cause, and it uses evaporation and condensation as a means to make that possible. Evaporation and condensation, which is a process which science considers the cause, spirituality considers it the instrument. For spirituality, the cause is that intelligence, that force that makes rain even be a thing. Note that I didn't say God of rain because it removes the charge that the word God has and it allows for more openness to try to see the view from the other point. This natural intelligence does not need proof through the scientific method. You can just simply observe it and experience it. It is right there, right in front of our eyes. Rain wouldn't happen without the natural intelligence of the laws of nature, of temperature, water, and the sun that makes condensation and evaporation even be a thing. We can then say that evaporation and condensation would not exist without that intelligence. But we can also say that intelligence is felt as a consequence of evaporation and condensation. Can you see now how these perspectives are just that? Perspectives. If you can't yet, I completely understand. It can be really hard to do so, especially if you very strongly identify with one of the perspectives. That identification can be so strong that we get to the point where we lose the perspective that we are identified with it. It became who we are, and we cannot see it anymore because it is the only perspective that exists and therefore it is not experienced as a perspective but as the objective truth. But it is not. It is still subjective. It is the perspective you hold. I can't stress enough how important it is to see it as a perspective. And don't worry, you don't need to change it. But if you would like to be more open rather than less, and if you are more invested in wanting to know more rather than invested in being right, the worst thing that you can do is to close up to any ideas that do not match your identity. By holding ceremonies for so many people, I came to see that most perspectives that are really attached to identity are not based on truth, even though it might be experienced like that by the person, but on wounding. And here's an example of how these wounded-based identities, confused by perspectives, can be born. Mary's parents are incredibly religious, and they are very dismissive of Mary's feelings using religion as the instrument for their dismissal. For example, Mary says, I am really angry at my friend for not lending me her toys. And the parents say, you shouldn't be angry. If you would have faith in God, your anger would disappear. Mary then feels that this whole God thing is making her feel even angrier because it is being used as a form of dismissal of her experience, even if she is not aware of it in those terms. And then the association happens. My parents equals religion. Religion equals emotional pain. And so my parents equals religion equals emotional pain and they are all inter-exchangeable. An aversion for religion then is born, an aversion that might not have been there with a different set of parents. And then more associations happen. For example, religion equals faith-based worldview instead of logical worldview. Since I have an aversion toward religion, I thus have an aversion toward anything that it is faith-based and therefore I have an affinity for anything that it is logic-based. All of this happens so early on and so unconscious that by the time that we are teenagers or adults, we forgot that there was a moment in our life where we did not hold this perspective because we weren't wounded enough. If we could heal the wounds that gave rise to these perspectives, we could also slowly detach from them and become more open to ideas that are not necessarily logic-based. By the way, the same thing can happen the other way around where Mary's parents are too logical and use logic to dismiss Mary's feelings. For example, what happened to you isn't that big of a deal and therefore you should not be sad. Mary might grow up with a very strong affinity towards spirituality because a logic-based worldview has caused a lot of emotional pain for her. So Mary 
exactly the same Mary could have such different worldviews, not because she was born that way, but because it depended on how she got wounded and where her emotional pain lies on, sometimes based on her parents, on the society, on experiences she might have, or any other thing. Alright, so why is it important to land in the middle? 1. If the way we look at the world is partially wounded based, then landing in the middle would be a consequence of the healing that we have done. We can use our way of perceiving the world as a guide that shows us where our wounding is and therefore know where to focus our healing. 2. The more that we can take out our green or red glasses, the more that we will see the world the way it is. By doing that, you are experiencing yourself to the beauty and the magic that comes from seeing the world both from a scientific and a spiritual point of view. They are both so incredible and they can enrich your life so much and you don't need to let go of your current perspective. You can simply be able to see it from a different lens and get to have one more way of experiencing the world. It helps us connect with more people by becoming more relatable, less judgmental, open up to other ideas, have more chances of creating open dialogue and maximizing the chances of learning things that we don't know. 4. Reuniting science and spirit amplifies healing by creating relatable spaces for self-exploration. 5. It also makes us more open to being wrong or inaccurate, which, if you think about it, why wouldn't we want to know if that is what's happening? Imagine how many arguments would not start, how many wars would be avoided or resolved. Opening up allows for what needs to flow to do so freely through that open space. One of the hardest places to open up in are those places in which our identities are deeply attached and thus one of the most important places to open up to. Worldviews happen to be one of those places. And last, and this one does not have a scientific explanation, is that I believe that holding both worldviews makes us more whole, more connected to who we are and puts us in touch with the magical aspects of the absolutely incredible universe that we live in, making it feel like a massive playground and like a true miracle. To see and feel the world as a true miracle is an experience that makes every minute of this short life a joy to be in, including those moments of challenge and the moments of rest. My life has drastically improved since the moment I opened up to the other team, in my case, the spiritual worldview, even though in your case could be the other way around. I did not let go of the old one, and I still have preference for it. But from where I'm at today, I can see how many of my needs could only be met by opening up to it. It is like I was missing half of life's possibilities. I feel more complete and more whole now, and that makes me feel naturally more grateful and more joyful. That makes my interactions nicer, and it makes the ride of life be one that is worth riding, no matter how crazy it gets sometimes, and sometimes it gets really crazy. And I honestly wish that for every person walking this world. Hey, I'm recording this after the video was already finished, but I wanted to give you a little gift. It is a summary of everything that you just watched, nicely put together in a beautiful PDF, so that you can take a look at it anytime that you need to refresh your memory. This will give you access to the PDF of this and all my other videos. The link is in the description below. Believe it or not, I left out a lot in this video, so I will be releasing another one soon, giving many more examples on how to bridge the gap between science and spirit. Until then, thank you so much for watching and for exploring this topic with me. Have you liked the video and subscribed to the channel yet? If you didn't, that helps channels in beginning stages like mine grow, so I would appreciate that a lot. And I'll see you in next week's video. Click on the left square to watch another video I made on a related topic. All my content is free. If you appreciate it and wish to assist me to continue releasing this kind of content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can also follow me on my socials and subscribe to this channel.